Hello. Hi, people. Nice to see you guys. Good morning. Good morning. Um, hopefully, everyone is feeling good. And um, yeah, I think we'll get started. So thanks for joining. Uh, I am Alejandro. I have a pretty old portfolio website uh, there, <laughs> which we'll be looking at actually a little bit later. Um, Twitter and SoundCloud are really the only um, places to catch me these days. Uh, I am with Adobe, and I manage Dreamweaver. So I, um, I'm very excited to talk to you guys today about some of my thoughts and also some of the thoughts of others on my team about the web and where it's all going. Um, and also the future of Dreamweaver itself, which is a tool that is uh, <laughs> rich with legacy. Let's, let's say that. Um, the web is moving very fast, and it seems like every day there's a new framework or um, some new hack or some new technique for accomplishing many of the, the various problems that we face as web designers. Um, problems around dynamic content and uh, dynamically rendered content, blogs, things like that, CMS systems. Um, problems around layout, responsive design, managing different screen sizes, uh, particularly pro problems around performance, managing images and other media. So. The platform itself is evolving very quickly, um, and who knows where. But the purpose of the web is not so that we can design the technology that powers the web. Um, sometimes it really feels that way. I have been really heads down on Dreamweaver. I've been with Adobe for about a year. And uh, in that time, I have not been able to take on any new clients with my freelance stuff. Um, and I've had to be very selective about what frameworks and technologies I explore. Um, I have a couple of big blind spots right now. Uh, I've never actually built anything with SAS or less. Uh, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I'm really interested in checking out. Um, Angular, JS, I have just barely you know, skimmed through the, through the Git repo. And so there, there's, there's a lot happening, but it, at the end, you have to remember that the web is not there to build the web. The web is there to allow us um, connection and content. And this, I don't think, has ever changed um, back when the military or Al Gore or whoever was inventing the internet. Um, the initial you know, motives behind that were, were really around connection. Um, if you look at the, the, the various networks that have exploded, the various uh, apps and things, they all connect us in different ways. Um, and certainly, the way that we connect has changed. Uh, I don't even have Twitter and Facebook on here because they're so obvious, but um, we've expanded this idea so I can connect with peers and go and live with them. Uh, I can drive with somebody. In fact, I took a Lyft to get here today. Um, I spend a lot of money on Lyft, and I'm now thinking about buying a car, but that's, that's the beauty of the service. It's just so well designed. Um, so we connect in all these different ways, but why we connect has not changed. So I was making mixtapes and um, fixing cassette tapes back when I was in you know, seventh grade. Um, and that was kind of my thing. And nowadays, I'd, we all throw, you know, if you have music to share, you might throw it on. You might reach out to someone through Spotify or Pandora or SoundCloud. You might share your playlists. But the reason we connect that way hasn't changed. Similarly, I think when you post a concert picture and you want to get a bunch of people talking about it and giving you the thumbs up, I don't see any difference between that and, and show and tell. Um, that, that, again, hasn't really changed from when we were kids. Um, and you know, if, if you were writing a note to someone in class, you probably weren't writing more than 140 characters. So um, in, in a lot of ways, that hasn't really changed so much either. It's just that the amplification is huge now. You can reach an, an, a huge, huge global audience but it's essentially the same reasons, the same driving factors 
behind why we connect with each other the way that we do. Um, the content itself has changed, but it also hasn't. So if, if you look at what we're passing back and forth over the web, it's still text, image, video, games, and maybe you could create a separate uh, category of animation, maybe not, but it's, it's ultimately it's the same. But we, we still haven't, um, the, the content itself has, has definitely gotten more, uh, well, it's, it's definitely become more abundant, so the, the quantity of content has increased dramatically. The quality of the content, of course, has increased too. Um, higher and higher resolution images and videos, higher resolution audio and music, these things have certainly evolved, but the content itself hasn't changed. Uh, to my knowledge, we still haven't figured out a way to package and deliver a smell or a taste or the way something feels. So um, it's still all about what you see and what you hear. So even though the web keeps evolving at such an insane pace, uh, I think at the end of the day, when you really try to get down to what matters most for a web designer, um, you're really talking about content and you're really talking about the organization and the display of content. So if you keep that in mind, it's less about using the sexiest framework of today. Um, you might be using jQuery and you hear all about Angular JS, but at the end of the day, if you're really, really quick with jQuery and you understand the framework and you're very fluent, you're going to be more effective. You're going to get work done faster. It'll be higher quality and you'll get paid more, which at the end of the day is, um, you know, a big part of why we're all here. I think most or all of us are probably professionals or striving to be professionals at what we do. We love what we do, but in order to thrive, we have to be successful at it. So again, it's not about using the best framework um, or framework du jour. It's more about um, getting to know your tools, getting to, you know, getting to a point of skill where you're very facile, very fluent with, with what you do. And at the end, um, you see pictured here a, a market in the Middle East. And I, I like to think of this as a good analogy for what we do because um, going back thousands and thousands of years, when people arrived at the market, you had a, a cart and you had your best fruits and vegetables on display. Um, performance, your cart had to perform to get there. The wheels had to be greased, I guess, and can't break. Uh, security was an issue. You had to watch out for trained monkeys coming and stealing your veggies and things. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I think in a lot of ways that, that hasn't changed. Um, so how you build and what you build is really what it's about. Um, <clears throat> So, interesting. Well, for the first time ever, I'm having some uh, technical difficulties with Evernote. It's always such a stalwart ally. Okay, so um, with that in mind, I, I want to segue now into um, how we on the Dreamweaver team look at the web and what we feel is, is really the most important, what we want to focus on, and what really comprises the future of Dreamweaver as a part of the web or as a tool that you would use with, uh, to, to design for the web. So with that in mind, um, let's, let's go check out Dreamweaver. Um, the way I see it, HTML and CSS form the foundation of the web. And I don't see that going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, we can assume, I think safely, very safely, that for the, t for the, the, time, uh, for the time being and certainly for the, for the foreseeable future, that will be the, the primary building block of the web. Of course, JavaScript um, is a major part of that foundation as well. Um, so providing tools around HTML, JavaScript, CSS, that's where we want to begin. Uh, additionally, you have some, some very popular back-end technologies. Um, we've always looked at PHP as a really solid open source back-end technology, uh, certainly not the only one. 
Um, uh, I think with, with JavaScript now uh, expanding in, into uh, including Node, which is a really, really powerful, a uh, lot of potential for back end. Of course, Ruby and Python and these things are, are very important as well, and Java with, uh, um, with, with its own stack. So we certainly don't look at PHP as the only one, but uh, with our sort of very cluttered history, uh, a history of including a lot of different technology stacks, some of which were proprietary to Adobe. I think that um, f going forward, our goal is to focus on open source web forward technology stacks. So uh, certainly things that are less proprietary um, and web technology stacks that we feel will be the most impactful for the future. Um, and when we, when we talk to customers, I'm constantly hearing that the, the CMS workflow, the CMS integration workflow is really important to a lot of people. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that today um, to begin with. The, um, the beauty of CMS is that it makes it really quite simple to, to populate your website with content. The challenge is that when you design, when you develop in, a, in that framework, you're really dealing with content that's um, kind of magically appearing out of nowhere in a way. Um, dynamically rendered content, uh, it populates HTML that's really not actually there. So if you try to edit the HTML, obviously you're not going to get very far. Um, so, but what we've done is we've tried to make this as smooth as possible. And um, for those of you who haven't seen this, this, you know, this hopefully this is somewhat exciting to you guys. So. <clears throat> The first thing we did most recently, in August actually, is we launched a new version of Dreamweaver which runs CEF3 or Chromium Embedded Framework in Dreamweaver itself. So one of the biggest problems Dreamweaver had, in my view, and still has today, is that it sort of tries to render content, it tries, but it has failed in the past to do so in a way that's true enough or reliable enough that a person would actually stay in Dreamweaver long enough to get into the flow of working um, because somehow, somewhere along the way, you notice inconsistencies. So now we're running CEF3. Uh, we've decided to align with Blink, which is Chrome's framework, and now what you see in Dreamweaver will render as it would in Chrome. Obviously, that's not the same as having you know several screens with every browser running, but at the very least, we're getting you uh, pretty much one-to-one -one parity with one of the most popular browsers and also one of the most kind of bleeding edge, all right? Um, the other thing, of course, is that we're committed to regular updates. So as CEF3 or Blink evolves, we're taking those patches, applying our own patches. Uh, we even have guys on the team that work with the web platform team there. So there's a lot of communication. Um, so that's kind of the first step toward creating an environment where you can really get into a flow and you never have to break the flow. You don't have to go double check something in, in, you know, outside in Chrome. Um, and the other thing that before I joined Dreamweaver, the thing that I used to do all the time was uh, inspect elements in Chrome, find the selectors that I had to find, copy the CSS, paste that into Dreamweaver, uh, save it, upload it, refresh the page just to make sure it's all working right. So, um, so in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that sense, let's see, what we can, let's see what we can do. So what I have here is a, a page. This is, my, <laughs> this is my portfolio site, which uh, really, really needs some love. Um, but what happened was I had built a blog page for it, and then I forgot to uncheck the option in WordPress uh, that auto, auto updates your WordPress installation. So it auto updated and it destroyed all my CSS because I just did everything right in the browser, right in WordPress. So now what I want to explore is something that um, some of our customers have, have figured out how to do very well, which is um, create a child theme, style your, your theme right in WordPress, save everything separately so that even as the WordPress installation up, uh, updates automatically, all of your styling and everything is saved separately. So what you can do, um, the first step, of course, is uh, th there are a lot of ways to do this, but I, I feel the, the best workflow I've encountered is to grab a WordPress installation, 
Um, save it somewhere locally. So download and unzip WordPress somewhere locally. Create a testing server, um, which this application, MAMP or WAMP on Windows, will run a PHP server in the background. This is, um, this is really good for testing WordPress, testing PHP content locally, and then making sure everything is clean before you go and upload it to the final location. Okay? So you'll, you'll run this. Uh, what you'll do is you'll open a start page just like this. You'll go to PHP My Admin, um, and, and here you can create a database. So I'm actually going to just do that and create a database for my site. Now uh, it's really just as easy as that. Now I have like a MySQL database um, running. This is all the stuff that WordPress would be handling in the cloud or, or online, as it were. Okay. So once I've done that, I'll go and go to my WP config. Remember, I've downloaded WordPress locally, so I find the WP config or configuration file. Um, I'm going to make sure that the database name is correct, and remember that we're doing this locally, so the host is no longer um, a MySQL subdomain. This now just becomes uh, the root, okay? So once that's done, <clears throat> um, I've, I've pulled the WP config into Dreamweaver, uh, and I'm ready to save this to my testing server location. Now I've already set this up, but just for grins and just so you guys can see, um, I've got my site, which I've named Aesthetic Grace. I've got a local folder, a little um, remote server that I connect to via FTP, and then here's my local server, which is where I'm running MAMP. So you see there, um, it's actually in the application directory. There's an htdocs folder, and I just stick everything in there, okay? So, so with that, now that that's done, um, I should be able to run a local installation. So if I refresh this page, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> um, um, yeah, okay, so probably I forgot to upload that WP config. So it's a little bit of trial and error, but eventually we get there. Yeah, see, so this is, uh, this is interesting. Even, even though you're working locally, you have to remember to um, save these changes to your testing server. So I click save. Um, hotkey in Dreamweaver is command shift U for upload. Okay, and so now that should get me back in business or not. So, okay, so um, I actually spent some time yesterday working with this. Um, and there's a little, bit of, a little bit of trial and error that you have to do. Um, this root, I may have, I may have uh, incorrectly added that. But um, what I'll do is I'll get the one, I'll, we'll go to the one that I did do successfully yesterday and check out what we've done there. So this is a gal out in Miami. She's an actress. And um, I built her website when I was living in Washington, D.C. But she actually, um, she actually wants to have a blog now. So I'm, I'm in the middle of kind of walking her through how this all works. Ah, okay, so here's the mistake that I made. I typed root, but I should have typed localhost over in this one. So when I do that, and now we wait. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> so this, this would take a little bit more um, tweaking and, tr and uh, trial and error for me because um, I'm obviously not, uh, not totally solid on that, on that yet. But it does work and I got it working last night with, um, with Jade's website. So um, I regret that that didn't totally pan out. But once you get that working, uh, you can install WordPress locally. And what's, what's really great is you can just do it all in Dreamweaver. So you see here, uh, I'm actually at a local, um, a local environment. I'm at Jade Wheeler's site, and there's this news, which is kind of my, an, uh, another word for blog, right? So we're, we're on that page. And what I can actually do is I can click in and out of the, of the admin panel. So this is really powerful because you can install WordPress directly in Dreamweaver in the, uh, 
in the site itself. And you can go straight to the dashboard. You can see I'm still in the Dreamweaver frame, but I'm in the dashboard. And I can start to make changes here to the appearance. I can um, select a new theme. This is where you'll go and actually um, create a new theme. So you see this 2013 child. That's a child theme of the 2013 standard WordPress blog. This is what you'll do if, like me, you've developed a site for someone and they've asked you to build them a blog and they want their blog to just be nested in the site and look exactly the same. So um, if, you, if you can see, as you can see, this is the theme uh, that I had, that I'm working with and it looks <laughs> absolutely nothing like the, like Jade's website. But um, all I'm really doing is I'm creating, I create a child theme um, which you can do in content under themes. It's, um, you know, very straightforward. I mean, you just take a, a folder like this, right click, um, duplicate, yeah, and then rename it to child or whatever, whatever it is that you want to call it. Then you'll activate it. Down here you've got these activate links. Once it's active, you'll go back in and um, the, the CSS file you'll, you'll want to edit. So um, going back here to Jade's blog, if I come into split view, you can see I've got two CSS files attached. But um, one of them is, is the actual CSS file from the theme. The other one is being imported from, from the parent theme. Okay, so that's how, that's how Dreamweaver is displaying two different CSS files. Um, so I can edit them both. They're both imported. There's also this um, text style CSS file from my original work on Jade's website. So now that I've got all that, it's pretty straightforward to make, to make changes here. Um, I can go, um, now there's, there's something that you'll want to keep in mind as well, which is we have this follow links. Uh, if you turn follow links on, when you click a link, it's going to follow the link. If you turn it off, it's just going to select it and give you the context in Dreamweaver itself. So something we launched in Dreamweaver CC is the CSS designer. Um, you guys may or may not have seen this. This is basically a uh, collection of visual tools for editing CSS. So let's take our, um, let's take our little nav icons and imagine that our client doesn't like the styling that we've done on these, on these icons anymore and she wants to make a change there. So what I can do is I can select any of these, right, and that gives me context over here in my, in my selectors panel. Um, and once, once I have some context there, I can actually start to highlight and, and um, roll over these and I'm not sure if it's showing up on the, on the page but you can see these dotted outlines showing up. So here if I click this, it's actually going to highlight those elements and that's showing me that this selector is controlling all of those elements, right? And, uh, but that's not quite what I want, I don't think. I think I'm looking for something else. So here's a button. And now we're getting closer to what I think I want, okay? So now that I'm getting closer, I'm actually going to come down to my properties panel. I'm going to check show set, which shows only the properties that have been set for, for those elements, or sorry, for that, for that selector, right? And um, I'm going to keep clicking through. And now I can see that this nav button link, button visited, that's controlling the text color of of the link, so that's not what I want. Here I have some anchor links, which I'm going to skip. But now I get to nav button. And when I click on that, I see my, my buttons are still highlighted, right? Now I can scroll down and easily see here I've got some border radius set. So this is where I could just, um, you know, maybe, maybe she wants them all to just be the same. So I'll just uh, use that tool and make them all, make them all flush. Or I can um, make them more circular or just go, boxy like that. So um, it's, it's meant to give you the context in the, in the rendered surface and it's meant to also give you a sense in, um, in the tool itself, um, give you a shortcut or a means of controlling these, uh, these styling changes that you want to make very easily. Similarly with the margin I can add or take away margin and it'll kind of render in real time. Um, so, um, so yeah, so editing, editing this content becomes a little bit easier. Um, if you have worked with WordPress before, you probably know that, they're, that the, the code that gets generated by the PHP is fairly complex and the, uh, 
the way that things are named, it's, it's not terribly easy. So this does become pretty powerful. If I want to just simply change the color of this post text, then, you know, I'll literally just click on the post, um, come back over here and start editing entries. So here's entry title A or anchor. That's, that's possibly, that's possibly what I want. Here's something else. This entry title obviously controls the whole span. So if I want to change something there, um, you know, if I want to, maybe I want to move these, these items up to the same level, then I could uh, make this uh, display in line or something like that and start experimenting with that. Um, okay, and you saw those things move up. So now what I might do is I might change, grab one of these. I've just clicked on that link and um, I'm hovering over these elements and there's entry meta. Aha, so there's entry meta. So I might do um, display in line for this one as well and see if that, uh, yeah, so then, so then that jumps them up to the same. I'm just experimenting now. Um, you know, this, this would obviously need to change. I'd want to make this, give this a new, uh, a new font entirely. So for that I might go over to um, my text style.css and uh, I might open that up actually and, and see, what, see what fonts I've already called in for Jade's website. So um, that's a little bit of a snapshot of, of the blog workflow. Uh, I'm sorry that I had to bail on the initial setup one. I just didn't want to spend too much time there. Um, I, we have a, a, my friend Kristen Long actually, she's um, a Dreamweaver customer and really, really solid on a lot of these workflows. She's got a great video on YouTube about setting up WordPress and working with it in Dreamweaver. Um, so. I did want to say one thing before moving on. Uh, we, we are working now on something that's going to extend the visual, sort of the visual contextual workflow from just CSS to include HTML. And what that'll do is that when you have rendered HTML content, right, so let me go into live code really quickly. What Dreamweaver does is it actually shows you the rendered HTML. So none of this is <laughs> real, right? This is all, um, being pulled from various PHP files in WordPress land, but it's showing you exactly how it's setting it up. And this can be quite useful, um, especially if, uh, especially if there's some, some connection between what you're seeing here in the rendered view and what you're seeing here in the code view. Um, I, I, I actually wish, I mean, I wish I could say more, but it's, uh, it's just, we, so we have these tools that we're working on now. Um, and, if, and if any of you guys, since you, m many of you probably live locally, at some point, if you want to come to the office, I would love to show you guys uh, the prototypes that we're working on and get your feedback. This stuff will be launching um, at the very, very early part of, of next year. And it's just, uh, <laughs> it's really exciting. Yeah. Can you speak to uh, Git integration? Git, yeah. Okay, so um, a gentleman asked about Git integration. I think that for Dreamweaver to go another year without Git integration would be a terrible crime against Dreammanity. So um, I, I love Git. I'm, I live on Git. I love it. I think that uh, um, it's it's on our roadmap. It's definitely part of this sort of third area. So there's like this HTML tooling, right? So we have the CSS designer. I think that we need some HTML tools, which, uh, which I'm inviting, you know, if you guys want to come to the office, love to show you guys this stuff, get your feedback. Then um, there's a lot of work to do with our responsive design framework. It's, it's um, been neglected, so we need to expand on that. That's happening next year as well. And then the third pillar for us is around um, creative cloud and collaboration, and part of that is definitely GitHub, because that's where people like to play. <laughs> um, there's, uh, there's just so much great stuff up there. And so um, good question. And absolutely, we're, we're, we're zeroing in on that. Um, so yeah, so toward the end, I will, uh, I will share you know, some contact information. And again, would just love to get, because you know, we're, we're developing these prototypes. But what we, what we want to know is, are they going to be useful? And, and what might we be missing? Or what might we be focusing on too much? And um, maybe there's some workflow, some really basic workflow that we're not getting there. Okay, so um, so that's a little bit about CMS integration. Um, I wanted to also touch on a little bit uh, just just working with the CSS designer itself because it is a new tool. Um, so here we are at my portfolio. Um, 
which, you know, it's not terrible. It's, it's just, it's safe and uh, I don't love it. And it's, um, it's also not responsive, which is sort of uh, silly. So, you know, I shrink the screen size down and things get kind of cut off. And so it's not, it's not really um, totally built uh, as I would like to, but it, um, you know, it's not beyond hope. <laughs> so um, working with this guy, working with the CSS designer is actually pretty, pretty cool once you get to know it. Um, this is another area that we're kind of, as we go, you know, we launched it in, in June. We're, we're iterating it, tweaking it, making it as, uh, as smooth and seamless as possible. We don't want folks to have to come in to Dreamweaver and learn the CSS designer. We want folks to come in and just click and get context and understand, right? You have to understand CSS, I think, to work in Dreamweaver. It's not about, it's not meant to be a tool where, you know, hey, if you don't know anything about web, you can use this to build a website. I don't think it, I don't think that's what it really is. I think we're going after people that um, understand web, understand HTML and CSS and everything else, but they like to work visually and they like a tool that keeps them in the flow. It's kind of like what I was saying before. You click on an item, you get some context here, um, and you immediately start making changes that directly affect how things look. And then there's just no, um, uh, you're not necessarily having to go and constantly check the code. You're not having to jump out to other applications and do this and that, copy things, bring them in, refresh, do all this stuff. It just kind of happens on the fly. Um, and with, with, of course, with, uh, with the idea in mind that it's, um, it's web forward, web standard code, and um, it's really all about, uh, you know, being or delivering clean code execution. So when you make changes in the CSS designer, you do your border radius, you do your gradients, all those things, the prefixes that are getting spit out in your code have been carefully vetted with, um, with the web platform team itself, um, you know, outside of Adobe. We, we go and we say, you know, now it's October of 2013. Do I still need a WebKit prefix for this and that? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Maybe those things are no longer necessary. So as that evolves, we try to, we try to keep, you know, we try to stay honest in that sense. Um, is that going to work? Yes. Okay. So um, the way this is set up, the CSS designer captures your sources or your CSS sources. This is any like uh, link rel CSS um, uh, document that you've defined in your, in your head. This is uh, anything that you've imported from another CSS location. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You know, you can create new CSS files, attach something from another project, or define CSS in page. This is going to stick CSS in line. Um, so this is something you might do for HTML emails and things like that, uh, which hopefully, <laughs> um, hopefully those guys get their act together and we can evolve from that whole workflow. <laughs> uh, but um, after that, there's another section for media queries. And uh, this is where you'll define your breakpoints. Um, you know, but also, of course, everything else. Um, we're, we're adding to this as we go. So there are settings that you can add here that detect, if it's, if it's a device, it'll detect um, the ambient light and things like that. So these are being added to the CSS, to the media query sort of module. And as those evolve, we'll be adding those as well. So there's a lot of really exciting stuff happening there. Um, this, this is kind of serving two purposes. One, it shows you all your sources and then the media queries contained with each of those respective sources, but it also acts as a filter. So if I click on this source, aesthetic.css, and I click on this media query, you can see the list of selectors has shrunk. And that's because this, this is the only thing that's been added to that media query block. So it's kind of serving the dual purpose of keeping you informed as to what's happening in your page, but also um, allowing you to filter and step through uh, the, the different things that have been defined. If I go to text, you can see that there are no media queries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, selectors is the, that is what you've added in your HTML, your IDs and your classes, okay? This also ca uh, captures some, some pseudo elements. 
So if you've defined uh, before and after pseudo selectors or if you've set some hover behaviors, things like that, those are captured in the selectors. Um, we'll be evolving that and, and evolving how we present the various pseudo selectors and pseudo elements as we go. Um, and then finally, the properties uh, appear here based on what you've checked here. And there are kind of two ways or three ways to navigate this. One, you have this full exhaustive list, which is a bit much, um, but you know, what we do is we give you kind of some navigation here so you can step through and jump to background, border, text, et cetera. You can also uh, truncate the list and opt to show only what's been set. So this lets you see all the properties that have been set for a given selector, okay? And I usually work kind of bouncing between those two modes, all right? So let's say it's time to um, make some changes to this and uh, make this thing, make this site operate a little better at a, at a lower uh, screen size, okay? So first things first, it looks like I've already set up um, some, some CSS here to control, for example, my, uh, my title or my page title. You can see that it's centered, whereas before it was over on the left, but it's pretty close to the top. So what I want to do is I want to find out um, exactly how I can maybe pull this guy down a little bit. And um, if you remember, so I'm, I'm clicking through these selectors and I'm getting my highlight area. You can kind of see that there's only the bottom line is highlighted there. So I can kind of step down this list. And remember, this is in reverse uh, cascading order. So it's giving you the most specific selector first. As you step down, you get less and less specific. The other thing, of course, I can do is um, just glance down here at the tag selector and this gives you a sort of horizontal uh, picture of the HTML structure. So you can see that this P tag is nested within this um, AES logo ID. So if I select that ID, you can see, um, you can see that that now captures the whole area. There's something to note here though. Um, there are three ide apparently identical selectors. So what you need to do um, and we're working on making this better, by the way. But what you need to do is keep your eyes, just keep, a sync, keep an eye on what's happening up here and up here. If I, if I have this guy selected, my AES text is in bold. Um, that means that that's coming from a text CSS that I've defined. If I click the next one down, um, I've got my aesthetic.css, which is my main one. That's in bold, but I've also got a media query selected. So this is coming from the max width 480 pixels media query that I've defined. Um, and then finally, if I click this one, you can see that global becomes highlighted. So this is defined outside of a media query, okay? So going back to this one, which is defined in a media query, I can safely assume that I can make changes here, which will allow me to fix the display. So um, maybe I'll just set a margin of 1% and I don't like that, so maybe I'll go 2%, okay? Cool, so now, now that's done. Um, and now my, my logo looks a little bit better. Um, here I have some, uh, some little dots which are telling you that this is the currently selected item, but they're, they're a little bit off center and they don't look quite right. So what the CSS designer lets me do is um, I can actually go and find uh, those pseudo elements. So just scrolling down this list, uh, side note, I, I, you know, having developed this site, I have the context that I know I'm defining these little dots with uh, before and after pseudo elements. Um, obviously, if you don't have that context, you, you might not know it so easily. But you can certainly, you know, as you, as you click through this, you can also um, just check the, uh, the CSS that's defined there. You know, you can always right click something and go to code. Okay, so um, here I have some uh, before and after um, definitions and this may, this may actually not be what I'm looking for. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Neat. Okay, so, um, this is a good, this is a good test for me. Okay, so let's click on 
this selector and let's actually go to the CSS code because I've, I've now lost my place a little bit. So here's selected, here's the before and after and um, for some reason it's not showing up in the, in the CSS designer. Okay, so that um, was a bit weird. I'm gonna have to look into why that didn't work today. But um, if you, if you want to make changes there, it's um, pretty straightforward. Let's see. Huh. Technical difficulties. Okay. Um, well, I guess we're <laughs> going to skip that one uh, today. And that's okay. That's okay because there's. Um, maybe a couple other things we can talk about. So here I've got this little, this little bird and this is my Twitter link but he's getting kind of lost. So what I'll do is um, I'll, I'll sort of click on these two elements and try and get a sense of what is, what is happening with this, with this page. So um, here you can see this is a hover behavior but just below that I've got a, uh, an ID which is set for this element. And you can see that the width is only 8%. So let's go ahead and increase that ever so slightly, maybe to 15%. Seems like it's doing um, what I need. Now, obviously, that pushed it down to the next, uh, the next level because I think that my um, element above probably has a width defined too high. So um, simply clicking on that, I can get the context for it and shrink down the width just a little bit. Um, and that didn't, that didn't do it. So I need to go a little bit, uh, a little bit less specific. Here I've got a portfolio heading background. And that one is in my, if you can, if you can see up here, this text is highlighted. So that one's going to control the text. Um, I can go to the next one down and this is now controlling the width. All right. But what I want to do is I want to make sure and duplicate this into my little media query that I've defined. Okay. So now once I've done that, the only thing I'm really trying to change is the width. So to clean up my code, I'm just going to go and delete all these little extra properties um, because I don't need them. The only one I really need is the width. All right. So that's giving me some nice clean code. Um, and now I can just slide this guy down until it looks good. Let's just say 80%. All right. So now um, I've got my little guy. He's showing his head. Of course, that text is getting lost. So I'll want to go and clean that up as well. Um, so I think that we're getting close and I want to make sure and leave some time for questions. So that's just kind of an overview of a little bit of what you can do with Dreamweaver today running CEF3 um, with the CSS designer and with this sort of reverse inspect or live, live highlight capability that we've, that we've added. Um, and then also of course the, the dynamic rendering. Um, that's really just a glimpse of what we've got. I, I, like I said, I want to show you guys um, the next set of tools that we're developing, particularly for visual HTML, but that would have to be probably on another day. So um, with that, let me just say thank you guys for sticking around and uh, listening to what I have to say. And I think we've got five or seven minutes for some questions. If you guys have some questions, I'd love to answer them. Um, that's a really good question and uh, we certainly support Canvas as, as an HTML5 component. Um, I think if you're, if you're just rendering, you know, um, it's, it's going to depend on the content but it, it supports Canvas to a large degree. Um, the, 
I think where where we're still working right now is um, some of the some of the plugins and um, especially I you know it, it's going to depend on what's going on behind the scenes. That's a tough question to answer. I mean. Right. No. Yeah. And and we really, I mean, we really just made the decision to um, align with with Chrome and Blink, and kind of stay close to them, and just come. So we've we've chosen one browser to render faithfully, and then um, there, you know, there will always be some differences between, say, Firefox and Chrome, obviously Internet Explorer, um, but and Safari, of course, but. Uh, but the differences, you know, particularly between Safari and Opera, which both run WebKit and Google Chrome, are much less. And then, you know, Firefox and and Chrome are, are you know, in many ways close together. But um, the Canvas question is tough. I'll have to, um, if you want to send me, you know, give me your information, uh, give me a card or something. I'll have to get back to you on that. I can ask my engineers about that. So. So yeah, I mean, we're really focused on um, HTML and CSS tooling right now. Um, again, visual tools that, that are there to um, help sort of maybe um, pr provide context as you're making changes and help keep you in your flow. Um, it's not about uh, shortcuts. It's not about hiding the code or anything. Um, we try to always, you know, there's always like this go to code option or um, in the HTML tools that are coming, they are, um, they're really all about the code. It's all about just giving you visual ways to edit and, and improve your code and also understand code that maybe someone else has written. Um, so if you're editing someone else's site, that's what they're there for. But uh, then as we go forward, um, building out building on top of our jQuery implementation, for example, more visual tools there, um, JavaScript, behaviors and things like that, we can, we can certainly, you know, we have, we have some support. There are, you know, um, these panels that are kind of, um, they're there <laughs> and they, they let you do quite a lot, but um, maybe the, the user interface needs some work and the intuitiveness of them needs some work. Um, there's like also CSS transitions, so we're, we're taking that up as well. So we're, we're looking to make all this kind of um, much more intuitive and, and much more um, user friendly as we go forward. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thanks a lot, you guys. I really appreciate all your time and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>